Okay, so I'm going to talk about microcaucasia. Now, this section, this lecture has only four organisms that you'll need to know about. It's going to be Micrococcus, Staph aureus, Staph epidermidis, and Staph saprophyticus. The only two pathogens that you need to worry about are Staph aureus and Staph saprophyticus. The others can be important. Um, but um, they're less, they're clinically significant, but they're less clinically significant. So um, I'll go ahead and get started. Okay, these objectives, you learn how to identify and describe. Um, um, let's see, enabling objectives is the principles of identification, there are different ways to identify the four, and I'm going to go over those, and they're specific, okay? So you'll need to know the different, the different tests on how to distinguish based on morphology and testing requirements and characteristics, and I'll go over those specifically. Okay, so it's genus Micrococcus. Those are the four organisms there. Micrococcus luteus, Staph aureus, Staph epidermidis, and Staph saprophyticus. The other two uh, genera are Planococcus and Stomatococcus, I won't be talking about. Okay, biochemical tests, the catalase test. I don't know if you guys did catalase tests in microbiology. Did you guys catalase tests? What was the reagent that you used? Hydrogen peroxide, 3% hydrogen peroxide. So when you guys were young and you cut yourself and or you scraped your knee and your mom put some hydrogen peroxide, did you notice that it would bubble? Okay, it would bubble because you're actually doing a catalase test on your wound. So there was probably staph there. So that's an indication that staph is part of your normal skin flora. And you don't want that to get into your wound where it can cause worse problems. So the reagent is hydrogen peroxide. And there's liberation of water, which you won't detect, but oxygen, which you will detect. And you'll be doing the catalase test today. So the reagent for doing the catalase test is 3% hydrogen peroxide. And you're looking for the liberation of oxygen, okay? The OF uh, glucose, OF, O stands for oxidative fermentation. It's the organism is either an oxidizer or it ferments glucose. So it either oxidizes glucose or ferments glucose, okay? Micrococcus, Micrococcus luteus is an oxidizer, okay? It utilizes oxygen oxidatively. That's Micrococcus. The other three staff are, uh, utilizes glucose fermentatively. It will ferment glucose. The other difference between um, organisms that are oxid oxidizers versus fermenters is that if you have a culture of micrococcus in the TSB broth, and then you have a culture of say Staph aureus in a TSB broth, the, the way you can tell which one is the oxidizer versus which one ferments glucose is where they like to live. If they're oxidizers, if you notice on the TSB broth, the oxidizers will live towards the top because that's where oxygen is. That's where most of the oxygen is. It will live towards the top. Otherwise, uh, the fermenters or the facultative anaerobes, and they're usually uh, the fermenters, they will live either throughout the tube or towards the bottom. If they're anaerobes or strict anaerobes, they, they probably won't like the TSV because there's oxygen in there, but they will tend to live towards the bottom. Okay, so the oxidizers on top and all the others are either throughout the tube or towards the bottom. Those are their fermenters, okay? It's, it's how and where they wanna use glucose. Coagulase test is a test that um, uh, you guys just set up and it's testing for the presence of a clumping factor that will bind to plasma fibrinogen. The reagent in here is a lyophilized, it's rabbit plasma, rabbit plasma. If 
um, in the main laboratory, uh, when I was on the bench, we used commercialized rabbit plasma. Now, if we were out of rabbit plasma, we could use um, human plasma. So what we would do is we'd take uh, the techs and they would uh, get their blood drawn and they would, um, we would pull the plasma together and then freeze aliquot, okay? So why would we use plasma as opposed to serum? What's the difference between plasma and serum? Clotting factors, correct. So what we're looking at is the clumping factor or the clotting factor that the organism has. So the organism has clumping factor and it will react with the coagulation factors in the plasma. In serum, you don't have any coagulation factors, remember? So the term I use is that the factors in, in serum, in the serum top tube, uh, either the yellow top tube or red top tube, the factors are said to have been consumed. So, which means that there are no clotting factors and it went to form the clot that's in that tube. So there are no factors in serum. In plasma, you still have the clotting factors in, intact and that's what it's gonna react with the clumping factor in, in uh, Staph aureus, okay? Specifically Staph aureus, okay? Not Staph epi or not Staph saprophyticus. The novo biosin test, five micrograms. Sounds like an antibiotic, okay? But it kind of is an antibiotic, but it's not an antibiotic that the doctor will prescribe for you for any kind of staph species, five micrograms. This antibiotic is used for ruling out staph saprophyticus, okay? So, um, and what we're looking for is sensitivity. If either the organism is sensitive or resistant to novobiosin. And when I talk about staph saprophyticus, I'll, I'll get more into the novobiosin test. Mannitol salt auger with 7.5 sodium chloride, it's a tolerance test. Now, in, when we get into the strips next week, there is another salt tolerance test. Some organisms are able to tolerate salt, meaning that they will grow in that concentration of salt. If it grows, then the broth will look cloudy. If, if it dies, then the broth will look clear. So that's what you're looking for, cloudy versus clear. If it tolerates it, then it'll be cloudy. If it doesn't tolerate it, then it'll be clear. And that's the mannitol salt auger test. Or um, this one is an auger test, growth versus no growth. The DNA test is an enzyme to depolarize DNA. And that's used to identify uh, Staph aureus. These two tests, I don't think will do, definitely not the DNA. But if we have mannitol salt, uh, salt auger, then, then we can go ahead. All you have to do is just plant uh, streak staph aureus versus staph epi to see if it'll uh, tolerate. If it tolerates it, then it'll grow. If it doesn't tolerate it, then it won't grow. Okay, so the whole family of micrococcaceae are gram-positive cocci, okay? Um, the difference is how these cocci are arranged. Everyone in Micrococcaceae, the Micrococcus and all three staphs are catalase positive, okay? So gram-positive cocci, catalase positive. And how they're arranged is clusters or tetrads. Now I have pairs and chains in, parent, in parent, um, quotation marks. Um, pairs and chains is only by, uh, by accident because when you when you take a colony of an organism and you make a suspension onto the glass, you're mixing up the organism so that it, you're disrupting their natural, their natural morphology okay, of, of how the organism grows. So if you take a cluster of staph aureus and you mix it, mix it on the glass, you're gonna get pairs and chains. The only way to get the true um, shape of the organism is to do a gram stain from liquid media. So right now, if you take it off the plate, 
you're taking a colony off the plate, you have some water or saline on the, on the slide, and you mix, 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 you're not getting the true morphology of the staph versus the micrococcus versus the strep. All you're gonna get is gram positive coxy, and that's what you'll see. But if you wanna see the true shape of the organism, you can actually see that when you do a gram stain of like a positive blood culture because um, it's, it's liquid media, or if you take a gram stain of a TSB and, and um, make, make it, um, drop, put a drop of that onto the plate without mixing it up, without mixing it, and so that you won't disrupt the, the organism, then you can see it's true, it's true morphology. So the best way to look at uh, the true morphology of uh, these organisms is to do it from liquid media, not from a solid colony. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Okay. The colonies are butyraceous, means it resembles butter, and it's either aerobic or facultative anaerobe. Okay, the aerob aerobic is micrococcus, like I mentioned, so it's oxidative, it, it lives where there's oxygen, or it's facultative anaerobe. It, it can, um, it likes oxygen, but prefers anaerobic conditions. So it'll live in, in a low oxygen tension environment, okay? Facultative anaerobe. And the facultative anaerobes are the staphs, the three staphs. Halophilic means it, it likes to grow in 5% sodium chloride, or many will grow in 10 to 15% sodium chloride. That's salt tolerance. That means it can tolerate sodium chloride, <clears throat> okay, that's salt tolerance. Okay, so if you look at the upper picture, you see mainly diplococcy. That's what you see, but you don't see change. If you notice, you don't see change. These are paired gram-positive cocci and they're only, so you would say, say uh, you would report paired gram um, you would say gram positive diplococci because that's how they are. They're in pairs. So they're, these are diplococci. And I can tell that this is probably a strep pneumo. Strep pneumo are diplococci. And also too, if you look at like this pair here and this pair here and this one here, and you can almost see, if you look very, very closely, you can see that there's a capsule around, around the pair, uh, the diplococci. That's a characteristic of strep pneumo, okay? Strep pneumo has that capsule. And so if it has a capsule, the colonies of strep pneumo are mucoidy, okay? So, and then also to remember, if it has a capsule, that's the K antigen. I think I talked about that in hematology. So if there's a capsule, it's a K antigen. And they're diplococci. Here on the lower one, you got chains, obviously chains here, right? So this is probably taken from a blood culture as well, because, um, because if you you can't if you took it straight from a dry colony off of a plate and you make your suspension, these chains will not be intact like that. You won't, you won't get this from making a, a gram stain from, from a plate. So this is how it naturally looks. These, these are actually chains. So this is what um, strep group A, strep pyogenes, strep group B, uh, strep A galacti, um, all the streps except for strep pneumo because pneumo is diplococci, okay? So all the streps that are not diplococci like this, like this, uh, look like this. These are the chains. This is the gram-positive cocci in chains. Sometimes, maybe due to some disruption, you'll say gram-positive cocci in pairs and chains, okay? Pairs and chains. I don't like this one, but it says gram-positive cocci in clusters, but this one, is gram-positive coxine clusters. You notice the gram-positive coxine are bigger. This was probably taken also too from broth media, maybe a blood culture, but you see the groups of gram-positive coxine here. 
um, the descriptive term for this type of arrangement in clusters is a, is is a grape like cluster in like a bunch of grapes. Okay, if you see clusters like this, then if you're reading a gram stain, and like I said, the ID doctor says my patient had a fever last night. I want to try to find out what's going on, and I heard there was a positive blood culture. Can you tell me what's going on? So this, if you tell him that I say, okay, doctor, I see gram positive coxie, he's gonna wait to see is it pairs or chains, is it diplo, or is it clusters? So the tetrads is an unlikely um, reading because tet, uh, the micrococcus of the, the tetrads of micrococcus are is rare. Okay, micrococcus is a soil contaminant. And it uh, it usually doesn't cause problems for anybody, but the three main the three main ones are gram positive coxy diplo, which is pneumo, gram positive coxy in chains, which is the streps, or gram positive coxy in clusters, and that includes Staph aureus, Epi, and Saprophyticus. So you can't tell Epi, Staph aureus, and Saprophyticus from this, but at least if he knows that it's a Staph then he can say, okay, thanks very much. So he knows that his, his um, treatment protocol will be according to how to treat staph, okay? So he knows at least it's a staph species. If it's changed, then he has a different algorithm for, for treating strep, okay? And then if it's diplococci, again, he'll have a different treatment algorithm for strep pneumo, the diplococci. So that's why it's important when you're in micro and you're reading gram scenes to make sure, be confident of what you're reporting. Okay, micrococcus luteus, uh, obligate arrow, okay. Oxidative grows near the top of the tube. It's a contaminant, soil contaminant, found in soil, dust, and water. And it's typically arranged in tetrads. Okay, you saw that uh, gram stain, tetrads. Here, tetrads right there. Nice, nice groups of four. Okay, tetrads. Okay. So it's an uh, OF glucose oxidizer. It's not a fermenter. So it's an oxidizer and it's catalase positive. And remember, everyone in microcaucasia micrococcasia is catalase positive and then gram positive coxy and then gram positive coxy comma and then whatever it is tetrads um clusters gram positive clusters or in a you shouldn't put pairs or chains because if a doctor sees pairs and chains then he's going to be thinking strep okay but if you're confident that it's clusters make sure you report clusters or tetrads Okay, Staph aureus. Staph aureus is a, of the four, this is probably the most serious one. Staph aureus is um, found in normal skin flora, nasal pharynx, uh, anterior nares, nares um, and the perianal area. Clinical significance found in wound infections, boils, carbuncles, abscesses, pustules, septicemia, TSS, which is toxic shock syndrome, and food poisoning, okay? Food poisoning especially, uh, Staph aureus is um, notorious for causing food poisoning, especially um, uh, when you eat potato salad that's been sitting out, so potato salad. So if you're going to a party or you're going to a picnic and they're serving potato salad, make sure that it has been refrigerated because if the potato salad has been sitting out, then you've given the organism the opportunity to grow, okay? So Staph aureus and potato salad. No other time will you hear potato salad in this class other than Staph aureus. So if you see it on a test, boom, it's Staph aureus. And TSS, that's for Staph aureus also in women, um, Toxic shock syndrome is, is um, a, a big deal. And I got some pictures here. 
okay, the pustules and the boils. Pathogenicity determinants. Um, Pathogenicity uh, determines the coagulase. We did the coagulase test, hyaluronidase test. We're not going to be doing that. The protease, lipase, penicillinase, or protein A. So uh, the only test that we're going to be doing is the coagulase test. And then toxins, uh, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta toxin causes. Um, this is why it, staph aureus infection is, is uh, serious because it causes the small veins to constrict. When the veins constrict and there's low blood, there's low blood flow, so the healing takes longer. Post ischemic ne necrosis, and that's probably due to uh, low blood flow to that, that area of infection. Uh, RBCs are destroyed. Uh, neutrophils, macro macrophages are also destroyed, and that's what the leukocytin toxin does. Enterotoxin, this is going back to Staph aureus again, potato salad, this affects, this causes a really bad gastroenteritis, okay? Uh, Staph aureus does. So again, you see potato salad, that's, I don't want you guys to stop liking potato salad, but just keep in mind that it's gotta be stored uh, refrigerated, okay? I mentioned toxic shock syndrome caused by Staph aureus and it's menstrual associated. Uh, other toxins, uh, exfoliatin, staph aureus, aureus, this toxin causes the blistering in the skin. And the uh, PVL, which is the Panton Valentin leukocytin, is staph aureus. That causes the destruction of WBCs. Okay, the colony of staph aureus. Okay, I think I, well, I mentioned in micrococcus, the colony morphology of micrococcus is yellow, yellow colonies. Let me go back to that. I wanna emphasize that. Bright lemon yellow. Micrococcus is bright lemon yellow. That's the only time I'll use that description um, for micrococcus, it's bright lemon, lemon yellow. Now there are yellow colonies, uh, which I might, mentioned, but if I say bright lemon yellow, then that's micrococcus. Okay, Staph aureus is white or golden yellow. Now I've never seen a yellow, a golden yellow Staph aureus, it's always white. And it's also beta, usually beta hemolytic. All the other Staphs, uh, Staph, Staph perfidicus or Staph epi, is not hemolytic or gamma hemolytic. I won't just I won't say gamma. I'll just say it's non-hemolytic. But Staph aureus is beta hemolytic. That's the important one. Micrococcus is not beta hemolytic either. Okay, and the colony is butyraceous. It's like butter. Staph aureus is coagulase positive. The other staphs are negative. Okay, coagulase negative. So hopefully. Well, for sure, you'll see um, a positive coagulase on the slide. You'll be doing that test today. And then hopefully on the tube coagulase, you'll see a positive tube coagulase. Um, Novobiosin, Staph aureus is susceptible. Okay, that means you'll see a zone of inhibition. When I say a, a susceptible, say for example, you have, you have your disc here your novobiotin disc, if there's a zone of inhibition around, around this disc, then that means it's sensitive or it's susceptible. Okay. And then you, you have your growth around here, but, but here it's a clearing, it's a clearing of growth. That means the organism did not like that antibiotic, meaning that it's susceptible, okay? Staph epi, staph epidermidis is also found. It's uh, in the normal skin flora, mucous membrane. Clinical significance, well, it's not really uh, a clinically significant organism. If you tell a doctor I, or, I identified staph epi, then he'll say, okay, no big deal. But in certain situations, like uh, when you 
get a specimen that, you know, that came from a sterile site and you identify staph epi, it's now the doctor's decision to determine whether or not it's clinically significant because it can be opportunistic. So it's also found in wound infections, urinary tract, subacute bacterial endocarditis, artificial shunts, valve infections, and nosocomial bacteria, bacteremia. So staph epi usually is not really clinically significant. Staph epi is not hemolytic um, and is rarely beta hemolytic. I've never seen a beta hemolytic, hemolytic staph epi and it's usually white, okay? White colonies and it's glistening. So all of these white colonies that you hear about, either the saprophyticus, the staph aureus or the staph epi, they're white and they, they kind, they're kind of glistening, but not mucoid. There's no such thing as a mucoidy staph. Okay, so these are white colonies. Staph epi is uh, susceptible, which means that there's going to be a zone of inhibition around the novobiosin. It's susceptible. Okay, it's coag negative. So you'll hear the term coag negative staph. That will refer to staph epidermidis or staph saprophyticus. Uh, coag negative staph. Another way of saying that is it's not staph aureus because staph aureus is coagulase positive. So if you say I identified CNS or a coag negative staph, then you're referring to something that's not clinically significant. It's either staph epi or staph saprophyticus, okay? It, there's no such term as coag positive staph. You just say, if it's coagulase positive, you call, just call it staph aureus. Okay, no such thing as uh, CPS or coag positive staph. But in your reading, <clears throat> and if you see CNS, make sure you're not reading about the central nervous system. It's a coag negative staph. For staph epi, it's a susceptible to novobiosin, and it's negative for mannitol fermentation and DNAs. Those two tests, the mannitol and the DNAs, are positive for staph aureus. Okay, and then finally, we got staph saprophyticus. Saprophyticus, uh, normal habitat, skin, and the genital urinary tract. It is clinically significant, okay, in UTI, urinary tract infections in females, mostly young, sexually active females, okay, can cause a urinary tract infection. <clears throat> the organism will, on, on uh, blood agar, will look similar to staph epi, meaning that it's not beta hemolytic and it's a white colony. You do a coagulase test and it'll be negative. It is a coag negative staph. However, on the novobiosin, it's resistant. It's resistant to novobiosin, which means that there's no zone of inhibition around the novobiosin disc, okay? Manitol is usually positive, DNA is negative. So, the way to distinguish between staph saprophyticus and staph epi, there's a way to um, okay, staph saprophyticus. Staph saprophyticus, it has to be resistant. To novobiotin. So the way you remember it is the S and the R are opposite each other. Okay, this is the only time when you have something that's opposite each other. So saprophyticus has to be resistant. Saprophyticus is not sensitive Staph aureus is sensitive, staph epi is sensitive, but staph saprophyticus is resistant. So that's a way to remember the difference between the two. Okay, scenario, 31-year-old male reported to the clinic with a puncture wound 
from a nail. After taking a wound culture, the following results were reported. It was beta hemolytic yellow colonies, butyraceous catalase positive, OF glucose closed, it was negative, which means it's not an oxidizer. It's coagulase negative, mannosol salt negative. Okay, so from that, um, can you figure out what it is and what is it's not, what it is not? So the OF glucose is closed was negative. So does that mean it's an oxidizer or a fermenter? Okay. Anybody just take a guess. Okay, fermenter. It's a fermenter. So what does that rule out? Which is the only oxidizer of the four? Micrococcus. So it's not micrococcus. So it's one of the staffs, correct? Okay, what about that fourth point over there? Is it aureus? No. So what does it narrow down to? Dazzy? Yeah, epi or saprophyticus. Okay, epi or saprophyticus. That's what the colony looks like. And I've seen this, okay? So the answer is epi. I would have done one more test. I would have done, what, what other test would I have done? If I had known that it was just coag negative, what is that? What it, you narrowed it down to two organisms, right, Jazzy? How would you tell the difference between the two organisms, epi and saprophyticus? Anybody? The noble biosin, because remember, saprophyticus is resistant and epi is sensitive. So I would have probably done one more test based on the morphology. To me, that that's an epi that looks like a saprophyticus. And then we went straight to the answer. Okay, micrococcus utilizes glucose, but not under anaerobic conditions, closed tube. So that ruled out micrococcus. Staph species utilizes glucose oxidatively and anaerobically. The catalase distinguished between micrococci and strep. Strep is not even an issue in this, in this scenario. And then, and then, like I said, I would have done one more and would have done the novel biasing test. Okay. Catalase test, 3% hydrogen peroxide. All you do, this is a very easy test and you'll be doing this, is <clears throat> that there's that one drop of hydrogen peroxide, the tip of a wooden applicator stick. All you do is poke a colony, right? You poke a colony, Okay, you have, your, you have your glass slide, put a drop of hydrogen peroxide. You, on, on that drop of hydrogen peroxide, you poke a colony. <clears throat> and you poke a colony, poke it. And then on your slide, you put it onto the drop. Don't do this. Because if you do this, you're going to create bubbles. So if you, your organisms on your wooden applicator stick and you just put it on there without any other tapping motion and the bubbles, the bubbles should come up. If you get bubbles, that's a catalase positive test. Okay. If it's negative, you get no bubbles. <clears throat> so touch one colony and then apply it to your drop of hydrogen peroxide. And if it's bubbles, it's catalase positive. And that's what you see, bubbles. And you have your worksheets where you can record your results. 
more pictures. Catalase, false positive. Um, if you use iron containing loops, we don't, we're not, use, that doesn't apply to us. And then if you pick up the media, the RBCs, the red blood cells in a blood auger can cause a catalase positive reaction. So you wanna be careful if you're gonna take your colony from blood, make sure you don't pick up any of the media. So control uh, positive staph aureus and negative control is any strep, okay? OF glucose, the OF glucose test, we're gonna do this next week. Stab, uh, get some bacteria, uh, cover one tube media with two mLs of mineral oil. The reason why you do mineral oil on one of the tubes is you're creating an anaerobic condition. Okay, the mineral oil will keep the oxygen out. So you inoculate the tube, overlay it with mineral oil and incubate it. Okay, so if it's an oxidized and then you have another tube where you don't um, overlay it with mineral oil. If it's an oxidase tube, you'll have yellow on the top portion. If it's a fermenter, yellow color will be on both tubes, um, on both tubes, which means that in the, um, the tube with the overlaid mineral oil, which is the the artificial anaerobic medium uh, condition. And uh, if it ferments, then you'll see yellow in both tubes. If it's non-utilizer, then you'll get no color change. QC fermenter is um, E. coli, an oxidizer. You can use Micrococcus or Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And negative is uh, a non-utilizer, which is um, I think that's Acinetobacter fecalis. Okay, the coagulase test. The coagulase test, the reagent is rabbit or human plasma. And then if the, the reagents we're using is lyophilized, so uh, Daniela added water to the, rea uh, the, the reagent and then, and then uh, she got us some coagulase reagent. Rabbit plasma is preferred because it clots uh, more faster than the human. So it's prothrombin-like activity. If you do the slide test, uh, the slide test, you're looking for what's called bound coagulase, clumping factor. Uh, the coagulase is bound to the bacterial cell wall and it reacts directly with fibrinogen. And if you do the tube test, which you have cooking right now in, the, in your tube, then you're looking at for free coagulase tests. So on the bench, um, the fast test to do is the slide test. If you do the slide test and it's negative, you still have to rule out the presence of free coagulase test because you're only, you're only detecting uh, bound coagulase. So what you do is you have a negative, you have a negative slide test. You still have to move on and do the tube test, set up your tube coagulase test, and then at the last thing that you do in the, in the micro lab is to read your tube coagulase test. And if it's negative, then you don't see the clot. Chances are, if it's negative on the brown, bound, it's, uh, it's also gonna be negative on the free coagulase. On, negative on the slide, negative on the tube. I've never seen it negative on the slide and positive on the tube, but you still have to make sure you have to rule out um, the free coagulase, okay? So this is what it looks like. There's clumping for positive, clumping for positive um, on the slide test. On the tube, it's free coagulate. So what you're looking for is a solid, a solid clump. You'll see that. You'll definitely see that when you read your, your tubes later on today. It's gonna be the last thing you read before you go home. So you'll be seeing what a positive tube test looks like. And it's going to be like that. You'll see that fibrin clot. You see how there's a clump of fibrin right there? That's the positive. And there's no fibrin. There's no clump right there. Okay. There's a clump right here in this tube. And it's nothing over here. So that's the, the tube coagulase test. Watch out for false positives on the slide test. Clump colonies. That's why... Um, you don't want to take too much colonies. And then when you add it with the coagulase, it's negative. You're actually seeing colonies and not the fibrin, fibrin clump. Controls for the coagulase test, positive control is staph aureus and a negative control is staph epi. 
the noble biasin, uh, five micrograms. And what you're ruling out is, or ruling in, or trying to identify is Staph saprophyticus, okay? So what you do is you're gonna take a plate of, um, and streak for growth. Okay, so when you streak for growth, you know, you want to streak one way, two thirds down, turn the tube, uh, tube uh, turn the plate, streak down two thirds, turn it again from the top, streak down two thirds, okay? Then when you're done, drop a Nova Biotin disc right in the middle and then incubate it at 37 degrees overnight. And then if it's resistant, that means it's not affected by the antibiotic, um, you will get you will get growth all the way up to the up to the disc. If it's susceptible, then you'll see a zone of inhibition. So for staph saprophyticus, are you going to see a zone or no zone? No zone. Okay. That means saprophyticus is resistant. The the S and the R are opposite each other. Okay. No zone. Mannitol salt auger. Uh, the media is, media is mannitol salt, 7.5%. And you're looking for whether it tolerates, uh, it'll grow or not grow. If it grows, there's going to be a phenol red indicator. And, and if it's positive, you'll see yellow colonies. If it's negative, then it'll be colorless, okay? It's too bad. I don't, I'm not quite sure if we have this media. I, I hope we do, that way we can see it. And it's to, um, to identify staph or it. A positive test is staph or it's a negative test is staph epi. It's a mannitol salt, 7.5%. And that's it right there. And then the microdase test, I know we don't have, also confirms Micrococcus luteus. So since we don't really care that much about Micrococcus luteus, that's probably why we're not uh, going to do the microdase test. Okay, that's it for that's it for staff. So are we clear on the four organisms? Gram positive coxy and tetrads. Gram positive coxy in clusters for staph aureus, gram positive clusters for staph epi and saprophyticus. All the three staphs are clusters. Tetrads only for micrococcus, okay? For saprophyticus, it's the only one that's resistant. <coughs> Remember, resistant means you'll get growth all the way up to the disc, okay? Epi is sensitive and staph aureus novobiosin is um, sensitive. But if you have a staph aureus and you look and you get it from a blood auger, would you do a, no a novobiosin test? Probably not, okay? So if you have a coag negative staph, the coag negative staphs are, are not beta hemolytic. So if you have a white colony that's not beta hemolytic, you're dealing with a staph species. Staph species could either be saprophyticus or epi. If it's beta hemolytic, chances are you're dealing with a staph aureus. If it's staph aureus, you're not gonna rule out, <coughs> excuse me, I'm not gonna rule out staph saprophyticus. Like I said, saprophyticus and, and epi are not beta hemolytic. If it's beta hemolytic, then you got a staph aureus. So then if it's not beta hemolytic, then you drop a noble biotin disc and then wait for your results tomorrow. <coughs> Excuse me. Everything is, is catalase positive. And um, coagulase test is, is positive for staph aureus and it's negative for staph epi and staph saprophyticus, okay? So if you have a coag negative staph, coag negative staph is either one of two organisms, staph epi or staph saprophyticus. The only coag positive staph is staph aureus. So if you narrow it down to a coag negative staph and you want to know what it is, then you drop your noble biotin disc and that'll tell you that it's either staph epi or staph saprophyticus, okay? Otherwise, you just got a regular coag negative staph. And a doctor is going to say, well, my specimen came from a 
uh, an 18 year old female and I want to know what's going on with this coag negative staph from the urinary tract. Okay, so then you drop your novo biasing disc and wait the next day. And if it's resistant, then you can tell the doctor it's reportable that he, the, the patient has staph saprophyticus. Okay, so are you clear on distinguishing the four organisms? If it's tetrads, what is it? Micrococcus. If it's coag positive, what is it? Staph aureus. If it's novo biasin resistant, what is it? Saprophyticus. Okay, so now you know how to, I, if it's catalase positive, what is it? Any of the four, right? Any of the four, if it's catalase positive. Those ones that I just mentioned now are specific to those organisms. Coag positive is staph, um, novobiosin resistant is saprophyticus, tetras on the gram stain is micrococcus. Okay. And that's it for micrococcaceae. Are there any questions? If not, did I give you guys a staff flow chart? Are you sure? Like a separate file. Hold on. Yeah. 